internationally was the first time that I did something in Spanish in the country that's not my country. And, um, and it was a very, very powerful experience. And the last night of that, at that orphanage, mm -hmm. every single one of the kids gave me a gift. All right, so guys, what you're about to see is a really cool interview here with Mr. George. George, say hello to the BTV Network. Hi, right, BTV Network. Awesome. And George is writing a book about travel and about how travel influences people's professional and personal passion pursuits. Uh, so he reached out, asked if we could chat for his book, and I'm very happy to be doing that. He's a good friend of good friends. So George, welcome to BTV. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Thank you for uh, doing this amazing work. So George and I are going to just kind of chat. George has questions prepared. Um, conversation we're gonna have about the power of travel and uh, hope you guys like this hope it's useful to you as you think through travel for your own personal or professional gains and personal and professional life experiences so uh, that's a little context take it away it's all yours absolutely so uh, like we we should probably start from the beginning sure. and uh, from the TED talk that you had uh, really loved the story that you had where you, you just came out of Butler um, just and decided, hey, I'm just going to go to San Francisco. I don't know a single person out there. Mm -hmm. Don't really know what I'm going to do. So what happened there? What made you want to do that? And what, what's the whole story on that? Yeah, so a couple of things happened. The first thing is there there was a uh, one of my best friends in college. His name was Jim Nikovich. And Jim was one of the few people. You know, I, I was raised in Illinois. Mm -hmm. and Peru, in, right? Or in, is it? Uh, Peoria. Peoria. Yeah. Okay. I, was, I, was I, I think there is a Peru, Illinois. There, there, is, uh, there is a Peru, Illinois. But, um, it's I was a weird raised, place. Yeah, yeah. Peoria is about three hours south of Chicago. Yeah. I was born and raised in Peoria, Illinois. And Peoria was a very, it was a great place to grow up, uh, but also very uh, kind of incubated. And there yeah. wasn't a lot of, I wasn't exposed to much global thinking and I wasn't exposed to much global curiosity um, until I went to college and, and, and believe it or not I played football in college for yep. two years ended up getting con some concussions had to stop playing it was the best thing that ever happened to me the green lights went away the, the green lights went away. yeah good good man you're, you're you're well informed so the green I was seeing green everywhere but th then what I realized was oh my gosh the world is so big and so I started to connect to people that didn't look like me mm -hmm. um, and and you know my friend Jim he did basically look like me he was from the middle of America a white guy um, and and but he was one of the first people that I ever knew. He was probably the first person that I ever met that left. He was from the Midwest and then he left and moved to California. Mm -hmm. He went to law school at Berkeley. And my my friend and I visited him one year. And I just, the second I arrived in San Francisco, I thought, I really want to live here. But I was still pretty scared to, to take that leap because it's just not what people did. People yeah. stayed in Chicago, basically, or Indianapolis. And those were the two big cities that people went to. And so I... Uh, started to become friends with a couple different professors. One's name was Fran Quinn. One's name was Andy Levy. These were older gentlemen. Mm -hmm. And they basically encouraged me. Uh, the, and I even quoted them in the TED Talk, which yep. was one of them said, you know, go, because you can always come back. Exactly. Yep. And the other one said, you know, just what do you, this is the time to sort of mess up if you're going to mess up. And what I realized is that when I got to San Francisco and then I was really exposed mm -hmm. to a lot of different worldviews, a lot of weirdness, a lot of amazing eccentricity. And it was like, oh, I actually feel way more at home here than I did trying to fit inside of some box. And so that was kind of my breakthrough moment mm -hmm. of it was a combination of mentorship and and friendship and then just general exploration. And then when you get there and you feel, oh, this this feels great, then you know that you made the right choice. Yeah. I mean, I think it's. Um... Taking that first step is the most difficult thing. Once you mm -hmm. kind of get there and you adapt, you're, you know, you, you like I said before, you become tempered and you're kind of more involved with the situation. Totally. So, and after that, you came to New York to pursue, yeah. pursue your law degree. So, what made you want to do? Um, you did two programs, I believe it was over your summer. So you yeah. did one in the DR, mm -hmm. um, you know, working to shut down a garbage facility next door that's that was burning. Um, garbage for yeah. in next to the orphan or next to an orphanage and then you did a health study when you were in uh, Buenos Aires and 
what made you want to do that? Like, how's the, are you? Are you? Is your background uh, Latin or anything no. like that? No. So or it's funny. So because you, you and Fred have like a similar thing going on over here. You definitely did your homework. Um, that, well, you know, I, I don't appreciate want to make a fool that. I appreciate that. So the, a couple different things happened. The first was I got to law school. I went to law school at CUNY uh, because I wanted to do. I wanted to be more in the policy world. I actually wanted to become the mayor of New York City, and so I decided. People said you need to be a you need to be have a law degree to become a politician. Mm -hmm. So I went to the, the the law school that was most aligned with what I wanted. CUNY was very focused on service of human mm -hmm. needs, um, and so when I went to CUNY, I I quickly learned that I that I was connecting really well with Latino communities. Okay, and I, even in San Francisco, that was the reason I chose the school that I taught at for AmeriCorps because it was ninety nine percent Latino, and I really wanted to connect with those communities, and I wanted to learn Spanish. But I am a experienced learner, so. Uh, I took Spanish class in high school. I did poorly. I cheated on every exam. I couldn't care less. I, about I, it. I got I got F in my uh, seventh grade Spanish class. So, uh, yeah. it just for me, there's just absolutely no way. People would always suggest Rosetta Stone. There's just no way that was going to be the way that I could learn. So, I wanted to do a uh, time and ex a rich experience in Latin America. And uh, at the time, I was going to go to Nicaragua, but there was some political uproar around Americans, and so we I. I Fred and I met once and he said, what, what do you think about the Dominican Republic? Mm -hmm. I started thinking, oh, that'd be cool. And then yeah. he said, I know somebody that has the, uh, an orphanage mm -hmm. in, in La Romana. And so we went there and, you know, it was, this, it was an orphanage. There was 125 kids. They were incredible kids. But then right behind the orphanage, there was a massive trash dump. Yeah. And every single night at 5 p.m., the people would bring their trash from all over the city because this, this orphanage was in a very poor neighborhood. People would bring their trash, they would burn the trash. Mm -hmm. And, you know, environmentally it was a bad thing. But more more, more importantly, the kids were getting really sick because of all the smoke. So that was the first time that I had organized local, uh, internationally. I had mm -hmm. done a bunch of organization locally. I've always been into, like, community organizing. But the internationally was the first time that I did something in Spanish in a country that's not my country. And... Um, and it was a very, very powerful experience. And the last night of that at that orphanage, mm -hmm. every single one of the kids gave me a gift. Every single one of these kids who had the worst stories you could imagine gave me a gift, a, a, a bracelet, a necklace, a love letter, a hug, something. And I remember I was there with a woman named Maciel and I told her, Maciel, this is, I'm dedicating my whole life to America, to, to Latin America. And the next summer, I, I wanted to do something in South America, yep. so I went to Buenos Aires and I did a thesis about public health care. Yep. And I did a lot of trainings because in, in Buenos Aires, they have free public health care. Again, my main, main, main goal for both of those summers was to become as fluent as I could in Spanish mm -hmm. because I wanted long term to be able to serve like Latin American communities. And that actually has served kind of a basis to your whole oh, uh, totally. company as totally. well too. Because we're completely bilingual. We have a completely bilingual branding agency. And that's where the story comes from. You wanted yep. you you fell in love with these people, yep. you wanted to make an impact and you're like, okay, you know, this is gonna be a focus of the people that I'm gonna go after and this kind of completely stemmed from, you know, these prior few experiences totally. but then your ex uh, international experience totally, as well. Totally. But so to answer your question, I'm not Latino. Mm -hmm. My father's Lebanese, my mother's Irish. And but I call myself a Latino. Latino. A right. gringo of, of yeah, blood I and it. Latino of heart. because <laughs> um, I, I do I love I love the culture very much and the language and the dance and the food and the people and the passion. I love it all. That's that's fantastic. Yeah. I, I think that's um, and beyond that, so like it kind of started the flame in you and what has kind of like kept that flame going for you? So you, 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 even now you, and I don't know, maybe you can talk a little bit about this. You still do extensive travel for yeah. speaking purposes and all this stuff. What keeps it still interesting and relevant to you? And, you know, from moving around so much, you know, some people just like, okay, I just want to stay home at this point. What keeps you going? That's a good question. I, I think for, for me, the, the thing that keeps me going is it's always people mm -hmm. and, uh, and not knowing who you're going to meet where, and I think, you know, I think that we're living in an interesting time. I think that we're living in a time where uh, there is so much fear in the media. Yeah. And there's so much hate that is being shoved down our throats. It's what sells. It, it's what sells. And, and, and in order to really, and I talk about this all the time, but like in order to really understand why that is the case, I always like to dissect. Like when I hear something, who's behind the message? Why are they behind the message? And what do they have to benefit from it? And when you think about in, in anyone that's like watching news, the news 
stations have to make money. Mm -hmm. And they know that we are biologically wired, that when we have good news and when we have bad news right in front of us, equidistant in front of us, we go for the bad news first. Yeah. When, we, when there was a lion and an apple tree, our ancestors chose to look at the lion because if you look at the apple tree, you get killed by the lion. Yeah. So I'm grateful that we have that in us, that survival instinct. The problem then becomes when you have a piece of bad news and a piece of good news, you go to the bad news first because your brain is psychologically wired to it's a you know fight or flight kind of thing and you are trying to survive. Yep. So that being said, my whole goal is to flip that script. And my whole goal is to say, actually, I think that we can reprogram the psyche of the world to see the hope and the good and the love before we see the despair and the hate and the misery. And so what keeps me going internationally is I see those love stories mm -hmm. and I see those hopeful stories and I see the things that happen uh, on the road that of uh, people binding together that they don't even know each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that what I try to do with the documentation of my own journeys is to show that, is to show people, uh, no, there actually is a lot angle. of good happening. There's a lot of amazing entrepreneurs that are doing great things for the world and the planet at the same time and still making a good living. And so uh, that's what I'm interested in, 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 in pushing out into the world. And so that's what keeps me going. And then I also personally just love being in new places. Mm -hmm. I don't do well continuously being in the same routine continues to be I liked and I also love to create I'm a create I'm, I don't like to consume I mm -hmm. like to create and so the more I'm in one place the more I find myself kind of consuming the more I'm traveling and, and out there the more I find myself creating I think uh, and I forget what the exact quote is but I think something along the lines of fears for those who have not traveled Mm -hmm. uh, essentially, it's just you know the more you get out there, the more you see, the less there is to fear for you. I think I think so too. I think the more you exactly right, the more you see, the less you fear. And yeah. I think that like the problem that that most people face is they're scared of things that they've never ever experienced. Correct. That's usually the case. I mean, I forget who uh, what video I was watching, but um, it was. Um, I think it was a travel writer or something along mm -hmm. those lines, and I think he went to Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And for him, you know, at that point, didn't I think this was in the mid, early mid two thousand area somewhere over there, and he was uncomfortable. And everyone was saying like, "Don't do that, don't go out there." And uh, he remembers being in a taxi, and um, you know, the guy's like, "Death to America." And then he's like, oh, crap, I better not talk to this dude. So, you know, take it easy. And mm -hmm. then he's like in traffic. And he's like, death to traffic. And he's like, like, oh. it's like, okay. So it's like, and then he like starts saying death to like everything. So I'm like, that was like starts talking to him. He's like, wait, what That's is, funny. what is death to like, what is death to this mean to you? Yeah. It's like, what, what, what is that really to you culturally? It's like, oh, it basically means like, oh, God damn it. Like. Screw this, you know, like forget, forget this. So it's not like I literally want to blow. I literally want to murder Americans yeah. and blow them up. It's just like you know, you did something to piss me off, and I'm annoyed at. You yeah, know? It's, it it doesn't necessarily mean the same exact thing that we have in our heads. Totally, and it happened. It also happens to me all the time. With, I spend a lot of time in Colombia and 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 every and, and Mexico too, but mostly Colombia. And when I come back, and I'm in different places, people are like, "Dude, Colombia! Like, did you see a lot of like murder and cocaine?" And I'm like, "It's you know." I understand where those comments come from, and that was a problem in the past. But it is it is like the most unbelievably beautiful yeah. place. And Colombia is doing a fantastic job right now. If you go to Medellin or if you go to Bogota, they're they're doing free tours, and oh, they're like, "Oh, this is like twenty years ago. This is not what the country is at." It's at not all. even close. And so when I hear things like that, I'm like, "Oh, you're scared," or you've been misinformed. And so I'm trying to break those stereotypes through work you know like mm -hmm. we were talking before it's like if there's a purpose behind this i'm not i'm not like going and chilling on beaches in yeah. the dominican republic i'm actually into that's what i mean by creating i'm yeah. into going with a purpose to to use my own skills and talents to be able to transmit whatever i can for whoever wants to hear about it and that's exactly the purpose of why i'm writing this mm -hmm. is to mm -hmm. influence people to be more thoughtful and to be more uh, you know, mindful and just generally more cognizant yeah. when they go out there. You know, yeah. yes, it is fantastic for you to go to uh, Cancun and hang out at the beach drinking pina coladas, yep. but you didn't really need to travel 3,000 miles to do that. You could have done that anywhere else in your own neighborhood and, yep. you know, just 
put on a flashlight and you know make, make it a little bit more bright. For yeah, you. or even just take a day or two exactly. of your seven day trip and go exactly. Out, you know, exactly. like, maybe go... you do want to go sit on the beach yeah. and that's cool. But like, take a day and go explore and see the the artifacts and see the local art and see you know talk to the local people. So, yeah. Do do something you know to see what they're involved totally. in. And by putting yourself in those situations, you start to think like, why are they doing it this way? Why am I not doing it mm-hmm. this way? Oh, they could be doing it better this way. Oh, I can do this better this way as well. And kind of to that theme, you're doing um, you're doing purposeful and intentional travel. Yes. So what have been some of your uh, biggest lessons, life or business or anything wise that uh, you've taken away from your trips? And if you got personal stories, love to hear it. Yeah, too. sure. I think so. A lot of different things, right? But like from the, the Dominican Republic trip, the thing that I took away was that people are in, inherently generous in their heart, you know, and I think that what always surprises me is how quickly people are willing to open up their homes to you, people mm-hmm. are willing to open up their, their cars and they'll f- to feed you. And I think, you know, so that, that's, that's across the board in the Dominican Republic too. I think people are starving for love, mm-hmm. you know, and when I'm there and when I'm with these kids and they're just nonstop have their arms around my legs and my arms are jumping my back, they're pulling my ear. It's like, there's what people are saying to you and then what the meaning behind what they're saying to you, okay. right? And so what they're saying is like, hug me. What they're, the meaning behind is like, no one is hugging me enough. And so I think learning those, the, like the nuances of language between what's happening and then like what's what's really happening. And that's that's the first thing that demanded really. I think, you know, for all of my travels though, um, s- some of the biggest lessons have been that what we just talked about, the world is not nearly as scary as yeah. people think it is. And by the way, I've done... I can't name the exact number, but 30 or 40 or something interviews. Yep. And every single one that I've done with somebody that's extensively traveled, that is always the first thing that they've said, that the world is a much brighter and more open and more of a wonderful place than you ever imagined. And this is a consistent theme. And it's it's kind of wonderful to know that like anyone that has traveled, you know, done a little bit of that, they're seeing the good instead of the evil that's totally. out there. And I think too, like what I, what I'm always amazed by is the power and the depth of a relationship that you can build in a very short amount of time with someone when you're out of your comfort zone. Yes. So traveling with someone for seven days, even if those are the only seven days that I've ever seen them in my entire life, actually I have a deeper bond with those people than I do with 95% of the people that I've known for my whole life. And I I don't know what it is. I think maybe it's a, it's a difference of, of where you are. You have a lot more trust. You have to build something quickly with someone. You are experiencing something new together. There's a lot of different reasons it could be, but I think that you can go really deep with with people. Um, I'm trying to think of like a good story for you. I can give you a hundred different stories of little like things that happened of people taking the me book. In, the me the, the book isn't that long. I'm sorry, <laughs> exactly. <my friend. laughs> exactly. Like I can give you a hundred stories, but instead of that, I think that like if I think more macro about the 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 experiences. Um, and this is, I think this is a great example of purposeful travel. Mm-hmm. The, I mean, that's, it is my example of purposeful travel. So what, what I did was in the beginning of 2018, I said, I love Latin America. I love entrepreneurship. I love inspiring people through content. Mm-hmm. How can I marry those things? And what I did was I started a competition called United of the Americas, which was a four and a half month tour around Latin America in, from January to May of 2018. Okay. And we put out this competition where the two winners would receive an all expense paid trip to the Silicon Valley, as well as uh, $10,000 of seed funding mm-hmm. uh, for their idea yeah. or their business. And we got hundreds and hundreds of applications from 17 different countries. People, I mean, I never met a lot of these people. They have no idea who I am. They're, they're, they go to a web page, they see what we're going up to, and they apply. And there, there's a small application fee, but still, it was an application fee, so they put money into it. And and I think that, you know, for me, the idea that there's this random person that comes to your country that wants to help you, you know, unite the Americas, bridge the Americas, and you believe in that person. Mm-hmm. And you believe in that person's vision. And you believe enough in yourself to give yourself that chance to win. Mm-hmm. I think that for me summarizes it. It's we are desperate to connect with each other. Yeah. We need to be pushed into doing something that we think is powerful. And the more that we can do things like this, you know, we brought these two winners, one from Bolivia, one from Guatemala to the Silicon Valley for six days. And they met senior, senior executives Mm -hmm. at Facebook and Google and Uber and Apple and Airbnb. And literally these executives sat with these two winners 
and they're like, tell us about your business and we're here to help. They gave them consulting, like the most high level consulting. And then they would, then the winners met venture capitalists and venture capitalists connect them to different people and they got a chance to pitch their idea. And it's like, man, spectacular. that's, a, that's about a hundred thousand dollar opportunity for $25. And, and, you know, I did it not because I wanted to monetize on it because I, I lost money on it, but I did it because I believe in that. And so then that became my kind of pillar and all the travel revolved around that pillar. This year we're going to do the same thing. Plus, we're doing a documentary film in Latin America about Latinos that are changing the world. That's amazing. So that'll really be cool. my pillar, right? It's kind of amazing what you can get out there with just a little bit of a push for people, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the fee doesn't necessarily have to be very entry or anything like that. Right. But it's just kind of like getting people to like, hey, you can do more and there's a network out there for you and we can kind of expose you to all of this stuff. So Completely. That, actually, and along those lines, I'm kind of curious, you know, like you have a lot of avenues uh, and networks to help all these people, um, you know, and you're kind of all over the place and you've developed your network through this way. And I imagine a lot of it's through travel and visiting mm -hmm. and friends and yeah. how, how, how has, how has traveling actually helped develop uh, your network and all these other connections that you've made throughout your life. I, well, I think your insight. I think I think you have like the question almost answers itself. It does. It does. Based on the insight, yes. but but the insight is right, which is, I make the effort. You know, it's it, relationships are two way street, and every, this is the part that people get confused about. People mm -hmm. are like, uh, you, uh, you know, they don't under, they don't fully understand that. Like I flew to Indonesia to surprise my best friend to make sure that our relationship was amazingly strong and that same best friend seven, six years later built my website. I went to you know a friend's b b first baby, second baby, third baby's birthday party uh, year after year after year and that friend became the person that connected me to someone that connected me to someone. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, I took a hundred hours to learn Spanish you know, I spent a hundred hours every couple of months learning Spanish in San Francisco so that I could speak Spanish. And then all of a sudden I'm speaking Spanish mm -hmm. in the hallway at CUNY and the security guard says, Hey, there's another guy that speaks Spanish. You should meet him. And that's Fred. Yeah. And now all of a sudden, 14 years later, Fred and I are doing unbelievably thing, unbelievable things around the world. But it's like all of these like overnight successes, whether there be successful businesses, successful relationships, successful partnerships, successful teams, all of these things that everyone looks at now as a strong foundational thing took exactly what you're saying a whole lot of running around yeah, being all cool. over the place and investing in these relationships and, and and it's not it doesn't even feel like a lot of work to me because I, I genuinely love these people but I think that 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 relationships are are just as important that for me they're even more important than mm -hmm. like the business itself because the people are the people like and then who knows what happens here you're writing a book you can, Fred connected us he met you because he gave up his seat for someone on the plane. I just believe so much in all the serendipity of all of it's it. It's crazy where one thing can lead to another. You just never know where it's going. And I ha happen. actually, it's so funny, George, because today I'm, I'm drinking a coffee in the in a cafe a couple blocks away from here in Manhattan, and, and I'm thinking to myself, uh, something really powerful is going to happen from this conversation. And I, I don't know what it, it is yet. I hope it does. It will. It will. And something, something powerful is going to happen. And it was the vision that I had was about four or five years from now, someone reads something that you wrote about me and they're going to reach out to me about something big. That was my, that's my, and this is the fun part of doing the video stuff. Yeah, we can look Here back in, on this uh, and see what January happens. January 2019, <laughs> that was my, my feeling. We'll get back to you in 2024 and see where this goes. Yes, <laughs> I love that. No, but that's, you, you talk about something that's actually really highly underutilized by people. And I actually had the same conversation with one of my really good friends that works at a top consulting companies. And she's actually one of the most well-connected person I know, like literally gets invited to a hundred weddings and mm -hmm. literally gets like a dozen job offers every year. And, um, I'm, and I actually asked her the same question, like, hey, what do you do different that, you know, I know you're a very social person and you're Yago and impersonable, but like, what do you do different that than anybody else does to make you like such a likable person and she's like well I actually show up like yeah. all these people that yeah it's one thing to call them it's another thing it's it's one thing to text them or Facebook message them I actually talk to some of my friends and then I make a trip and actually go there like I'll visit some somebody <sighs> random that I hadn't if I'm on a consulting project in Minneapolis 
I'll visit some friend that I haven't talked to in totally. 15 years. Totally. Or if I'm traveling, if I have a person living, a friend living in Italy, um, I'm why not? I'm going to go make a trip out of it and go hang out with them for, for a day or two and also enjoy myself and do something else. Totally. So showing up is showing up, so man. much of the battle. When I'm with you, I am with you. Mm-hmm. I was having dinner last night with a friend and I was telling I was telling her we're talking about like long distance relationships yeah, yeah. and how it's difficult. And I think for me it was it's because when I'm with you, like I'm not thinking about anything else right now but you. Yeah. Right now, me and you. And so and I think that what's what's happening a lot now is people are so distracted that like even when they're together, they're not together. So I would prefer to see you one hour a year and have that hour be so hyper present that you felt like you got a month of my life. Yeah than seeing you every day and being on my phone while we're talking. And then I think the other thing is um, showing up is really important, and I call it living in their world. So showing up is one thing, but I've had friends show up here with like their own agenda. Yeah. And I think what for me what's really, really worked well, I'll have a couple things that I want to do when I arrive somewhere, but for the most part, I look at, I would arrive here to your apartment, and I would say, George, and you'd be like, what do you want to do? And I would say, I want to live in your world. And I think that's kind of the important part, and that's where all this creativity and where all this challenge to yourself comes from. Yep. It's the uh, openness to, you know, not only let yourself into other people's world, but to let them into yours as well. And you're right. The creativity, actually, a lot of my creativity mm-hmm. comes from that, from like just living in another person's world because they, I create my world here. And I know what I'm going to do. I know how I want to do it. And, and that's great. And it works for yeah. me. Right. But there's equal magic in like, what do you do during the day? Like, what does your morning smoothie look like? What do you cook when you're hungry? What is your, you know, what is the greatest thing that you and your girlfriend yeah. do to keep the relationship spicy? Because then maybe I can take something from that and apply it to my own that's thing. That's the whole point of everything. Exactly that. You're better. You're and, upgrading yourself. You're taking the... Uh, best of what you find in yep. other people or yep. other cultures or other countries and you're making it a part of yourself That's to it. make you a better you. You're still you, but you're just That's it. a better version of That's it. That's it. Totally. And yeah. you you bring a very valid point, right? We're so often we're okay, you know, we're hanging out and like, oh let me answer this text like that. You know, you're not really or it's like let me person. show you inst- let me show you this guy's Instagram. I'm like, but I don't know anything about you. Yeah. You know? Tell me about you first. A lot of that is lost and a lot of relationships have become superficial and it's also contributed to the uh, the fact that, I don't know, like 90% of our population has ADD now. Then, yeah. I mean, that's because we're doing 16 different things at the same time. It's never truly, hey, I'm talking to you, I'm involved in you. But I also think like <clears throat> it's because people are not listening to their own inner passion enough. Mm-hmm. Whatever it is that you are bored about does not have to become your reality. It doesn't have to be your reality. You can change it. And there are so many ways to change it. And that's something that I'm really passionate about. I'm actually curious. What are some ways to change change your environment? Well, like, what, actually, actually and I'm, I'm curious. What would you have told yourself if you're talking to like the 15, 16 year old you? What would no. you have done differently? So, you younger? so let me answer the first question yeah. first. So what can you do? It's you're doing it. You're, you're a perfect example of someone that's doing it. You had a p- career. You did it for a long time, and then you said, I want to write a book. And and you could have, for the next 15, 20 years, bitched and moaned about the fact that you didn't have time. I probably would have. But you didn't. So months ago, you said, enough. I'm leaving this job. I'm starting my own like side consultancy business to make the money that I need, and I'm going to write. Mm-hmm. And your soul is on fire now. Now you're talking to 30, 40, 50 people. That yeah, you, that, you that You're inspired. It's a lot of fun. So, so that was a choice that you made. What I would tell my 15 or, so, or uh, let me answer, let me continue. Answering please, please. If you are in a position where you are in a job that you don't like, mm-hmm. then you can use your evening time to start doing things that you do like, you know, and you can start to be, use your weekends as doing something that you do like. What I would tell a 15 or 16 year old version of myself is 15. I was what? It was in high school. I yeah. was a sophomore in high school. I would have told myself a couple different things. I would have told myself, number one, get more hobbies. Make yourself more interesting because I was just a jock. I was an athlete. I was a nice guy. I was very popular. But I, my whole life revolved around sports. Mm-hmm. And that was also a product of my environment. Yeah. That was a very important thing in, in the Midwest that you played sports. Small town. So totally. You do. 
That's what you do. And that, that's fine. And, and there were a lot of great things that happened because I was an athlete. Like I, I attribute a lot of my success professionally to my athletic background, mm-hmm. discipline, hard work, teamwork, leadership, blah, blah, blah. But I do think that like life was much bigger than I realized. So I would say do more hobbies, whether it be dance or languages or whatever the case may be. And the other thing I would say is surround yourself with a lot more people that don't look like you. I referenced this in the beginning. You know, it's it's so weird to me that in so many parts of the world, the, your high school and your college are such a gross, massive misrepresentation of what real life is like. Yeah. Because everyone from 18 to 22 that's in college, in most of the colleges in the U.S., looks, thinks, acts, comes from the same family, has the same net worth, has the, grew up in the same private schools yeah. as you did. And if you walk outside right now, that's not how the streets look. You know, if you walk into a business right now, that's not how the businesses look. It's so weird. It's like, it's so I would tell myself like, Brian, the microcosm that you are living in right now is 1000% not representative of the world. So get out. And I started doing almost 21 and meet people that don't look like you mm-hmm. that have different ages and, and sexual orientations and incomes and, you know, views on food and, 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 and spend more time with them and just learn. And actually you're hitting the back end of my book. I told you before we started this whole thing, the first seven chapters, what they're concentrating on, but the back end's actually exactly what you talked cool. about is you don't actually like, it's awesome if you can travel, but I understand that everybody can do a trip to the DR or Spain or what yep. have you. It's not a reality for yep. every single individual out there, but it is a reality for every single individual out there to go to a town over. You totally know, to go just yeah. you know like drive for an hour and see what the heck else is out there and it, meet other it, it doesn't have it, the one the, the the coastal america from mid america or south america or what have you is just a complete 180 enough that it's enough to uh breed curiosity and get your wheels turning and expose you to enough stuff to actually influence you and change you and totally. make you realize a lot of things about the world. And let me throw something else out, out there at you that, that might be interesting for the readers. What I it's think is true. interesting now about the world that we're living in is I actually think that what you should, so this is something else I tell my 15, 16 year old self mm-hmm. is invest in your skill sets. Yes. And here's why. So. Uh, let's just say I'm a 15 year old kid and mm-hmm. I love making videos, Yep. which is happening all the time now, right? If you're a 15 year old kid and you love making videos, then get really good at making videos. Get good at shooting them, at storytelling them, at editing them, at distributing them. And then here's how I actually think it's completely 100% possible for you to travel the world, even if you're 15, 16, even if you're super poor. Mm-hmm. You then start to build a portfolio of work and you start sending that around. Like I would send it to a hotel in the Dominican Republic. I would send it to um, an influencer in the Dominican Republic on Instagram. And I would send it to a local restaurant. And I would say, hey, my name is Brian. I'm 16. I'm very passionate about video. I will, if you pay for my flight and you put me in your hotel, I will shoot video for you. And you're going to email or DM or message 100 or 200 or 300 people. One of them is going to say yes. All of a sudden, you're in the Dominican Republic. And it's all because you learned the skills that you needed to learn about filming. So, and the same is true of writing and the same is true of coding and the same is true of painting and the same is true of accounting and the same is true of branding. Mm -hmm. It's... When you, when you build your personal brand, and this is why I believe so much we've built our, basically our entire agency around personal branding. Yeah, yeah. When you build a personal brand that's solid, that's backed by skills, there's no robot that can stop you. There's no commoditization of the internet that can stop you because you have done the work to become irreplaceable. Mm-hmm. And I think that even if you're 15 or 16, especially if you're 15 or 16, you can do that. I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head. And I mean, that's kind of the focal focus of this whole book I can I can write not 12 chapters I can write you a thousand chapters but all if all you do is you know read the chapter say hey that was fun this is great you uh-huh. know mm-hmm. throw, throw it away then it didn't really mean anything right. you know it didn't really do anything but right. if you're if you get up and like you know what I've been thinking of, of taking this Italy trip or you know I've been thinking of visiting my aunt in you know uh, Ireland or whatever, like when I was older, 
why don't I just do that now? Or why don't I just take some action? It's just taking action. Totally. That's the biggest takeaway. Life is more fun when you're going somewhere to help someone. And that can look a lot of different ways. You know, like it can be, you know, you're, you're in an orphanage working in an orphanage. I mean, there mm-hmm. are so, there's so many people in this world that need help. And I'm not saying like need a handout. I'm saying need your skills. Yeah. And if, if you go to, you can go to Ireland to visit your aunt and that's cool. But if, if you don't have money to do that, then there are so many creative ways to get to Ireland. I mean, you could write to every backpack company in America and say you're about to go, you're about to go hike the cliffs of Moor, mm-hmm. and you will do a video a day for them to use on Snapchat and Instagram if they give you a backpack and maybe pay for half of your flight or maybe pay for all of your flights. See, that's good advice right there. So, I, but th- that's yeah. the kind of stuff that like I'm, I'm more, I'm blown away. I almost want to do like a year where I just. Don't char- I just barter for everything. I almost want to do like a, a, a documentary or a book about the the year of barter or the year of yes, where it was the year of you know mutual mm-hmm. yeses, where it's I am literally going to travel the world and not spend one dollar. Yeah, and, and pe- people have done yes, similar similar things have. to that, and I forget what it was, but you started out with a dollar and how to barter yourself up to like a house, to a house, yeah, house or something like you get like you start a dollar and then you get an orange, or I think it was you start with an orange. How do you turn an orange into a house? Some, something like that. Thumbtack? thumbtack? Was it a thumbtack? That's what it was? Yeah. I, I, I remember that. That like, sticks out of my it's head. It's so but the, cool. But that that's kind of the cool part of it. It's just like there's so many ways that you can do things that you, know, you so don't necessarily ways. need to be really rich or well off. Or have any money. Or, yeah. Exactly. You know, and, and, and that's the advantage of the digital world that we live in. Yes. But you have to have the skills. Correct. And that's where you have to, that's where, that's where it all starts for me. And yeah. Then you need to put in the work to do that. You know, yeah. no, nothing's a handout. Yeah. No, nothing is a handout, you know, and it's just as it is with any interview, you know, if uh, you can be as well connected or you can be as well off or what have you as anybody else. But if you don't have the skills to back yourself up, if you don't have the, you know, the, the personality that makes you want to get out there and people to get to know you and stuff, um, uh, it's not really going to pay off as, mm-hmm. as much as you would in the long mm-hmm. run. So you do need to put in that work on yourself to get yourself there to that point of where you can pretty much do anything. Totally. And that, and it doesn't have to be branding. It doesn't no. have to be finance. It doesn't have to be video or editing or what have you. It can literally be anything you can Making imagine. Cups. Making cups. you know, I think, Tying shoes for yeah. kids. I mean, there's like so many things that you can do. Yeah, there's a billion dollar company now. I see, I see ads for it. Um, I mean, not, uh, I don't know how, how much it's worth, but there's, you know, literally picking garbage out of the ocean, right? They turned that into uh, millions and millions of dollars worth of a company. Right? And the thing that I think is important about that point that I, when I speak to university students around the world, mm-hmm. this is what I say to all of them, which is don't chase the trend. You will lose. And here's why you'll lose. Because now if all of a sudden, uh, you know, blockchain, blockchain is popular now. Blockchain yeah. is going to continue to grow. And blockchain is going to be a trend that will be around for a while yeah. and it will turn into more of a norm. But if you're trace, if you are 19 and you are chasing blockchain because you think that you will make millions of dollars mm-hmm. blockchain, by the time you learn what you need to about blockchain to make the million dollars, it will change so okay. fast. So everyone's always like, "What's the next trend?" And I think that that's the wrong question. the The right question is, "What do you love more than anything in the world?" Because that's your best shot at becoming really successful at it. So if you really genuinely, passionately care about removing plastic from the ocean then this is something that's a good idea for you to jump on. If you think that you're going to do that and just become someone that loves the ocean and taking plastic out because there's going to be money in it, you'll lose. You're in the wrong thing. You'll lose. Yeah. And I think the bigger problem is is um, there's more and more people that are so bombarded with things that they're confused that they actually don't even know what that's totally they really true. like and that's what they're totally passionate true. about. I'm in that camp, actually. You know, like mm-hmm. I spent so many years of my life just being like, Oh my God, I had to discover a passion, something that I absolutely love and only can see this in front of me. And that's not really necessarily the case. If, mm-hmm. if you're, you can't just be like looking for it, it's like completely like engulfed in it. You kind of have to open yourself up and do yeah. a lot of different experiences and um, just, like I said, have an open head, uh, have an open heart, uh, put yourself out there and eventually something comes. And if something doesn't, as long as you're just comfortable with the idea that you're doing something where you're um, happy. I think the one of the hardest questions I've ever had to ask myself, and I forget who told me this, but it, I got asked, like, hey, George, what if you never discover what you're passionate about? Yeah. And I'm like, 
it's like are you gonna be okay with that like and yeah. it's like it's that question of like you know what not everybody's gonna be a millionaire not everybody's gonna do something that they love but you brought up an interesting point if you're doing something you know nine to five that you're not crazy about but then you're spending your five to ten or five to eleven or your weekend or something like that doing something that you do get some joy out of i think that's a life well worth living it's and and not only that but like eventually what i've been seeing just from a lot of people because i i you know i consult individuals yeah. as well and, and what i see is what happens is that so the nine to five happens and then the five to let's just say five to ten mm -hmm. um the five to ten all then becomes five to eleven then it becomes five to twelve then it becomes five to one a.m then it comes five to two a.m then all of a sudden the five to two a.m is making as much money as the job mm -hmm. and you're like oh there's like a light bulb moment where you're like, I can, I can leave this now, you know? And I think that that's where I want to help people get yeah. to, which is, you know, I left a nine to five job and I had a great nine to five job and I left it without having any idea what I was going to do for a business. Mm -hmm. And that was really stressful. And I think so what, what, when people are like, yo, Brian, I, I love your content. I'm quitting my job tomorrow or do my own thing. I'm like, Ooh, how much money do you have saved up in the bank? Because let me tell you something. Well, as good as that sounds, it's incredibly stressful. It's very stressful. If you have no money in the bank and four months from now, you're going to have to go back to that job and you're going to be really embarrassed and you're going to be feel defeated and deflated. So instead of that, like it's, it goes to your point, which is take your time. And, and it's funny, this whole idea of like a life purpose and a life passion, I wrote a LinkedIn article or, or on my blog or something a little while ago that went really, really crazy. People loved it, which mm -hmm. was why your life purpose is destroying you or why your life purpose is leading to your slow death. Okay. Something like that. And I think that the idea of a life purpose is a very American thing. It is. And I think that like we can, and there's so many things I love about being an American, but the, there, the, the, the pressures that are put on so many of us to find our life purpose literally lead us into almost like a self-help addiction yeah. where it becomes so consuming of our own, uh, what is my purpose that you completely lose the energy and the drive to give anything else to other people because yeah. you're so in your own head and it happens to me too. And I have to, this is where like m me kind of evolving to know myself more has, has been really fun. There have been so many times where I'm like, you know what, Brian, you need to get out of your apartment and stop trying to be so enlightened and stop trying and go out there and do something nice for someone else because you are so in your own head mm -hmm. right now about finding your life purpose that you're serving no one, including, and most importantly, yourself. Yeah. I'm passionate about that, which is, first of all, the, the life purpose thing might just be a myth. Mm -hmm. It might not, it, it's, it's invented from somebody and it's probably invented by like all these self-help coaches that yeah, want okay. you to so, buy so, their $97. So, so book, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> buy, buy, buy this, then eight steps to how to find your life purpose, only nine ninety nine. Yeah, and I think, I think that, 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 you know, there's some of that is useful and some that's not, but I think that for me, and you, you almost said it, I could see you saying like, you said happy instead of the word that I look for is, which is peace. Like, what if, what if you could never find your life purpose? Would you feel at peace? Like, that's for me even better than, like, happy. Yeah. I would rather be at peace than happy. And so, the... the and I think that was actually what the person said. Well, I'm you like, almost said it. Like, I was watching yeah, you. I was, yeah, like, waiting to see what yeah, you were yeah. going to say next. I, th I, th I think, that's, I think that, that, that's actually what it was like. Yeah. Like, are you going to be at peace with yourself? Yeah. Or are you going to be okay with this? And not... Yeah, but I see what you're going. So yeah. let's just say that, that okay, so if, if you're stressed out, if you're stressed out about finding your life purpose, here's some good news. It's probably made up by some industry that wants to make money from you. So you can chill out on that and stop stressing trying yeah. to find your life purpose and try to find your life's peace or try to find things that make you happy. And then you do that enough and it turns into something bigger. Second thing is for someone like you who's like, I don't know what my thing is. Just think, I always have people think a lot about the books that you're reading, mm -hmm. the videos that you're watching. And this is a good one too. What are people coming to you for advice about? Yeah. Because the chances are if someone keeps coming to you advice for advice about something and it's happening more than once for more than one person, maybe you're good at it. Yeah, exactly. And I think you hit the nail on the head. And as soon as you said the whole American concept, I had the uh, a real crazy rich Asians quote, quote, go off in my head. Happiness is such an American concept. This is so American because you're Eastern European. I mean, yeah. you're Georgian. So it's like that. this idea, and this is also in Latin America. It's like this idea of like your life's purpose. It's starting to catch on a little bit there, but it's like this idea, like people are really, really happy. And most of the people that are really, really happy yeah. don't have a job that they like. 
you know? And so, I mean, most of the people that are really, really happy aren't well off in general. And this right. is kind of the bigger thing that I've heard from multiple people is if you look and you travel and, you know, you're, you're thinking you're a rich ass person and you go out there and you see all these people that have nothing, but they're you've got smiles on their face. They're hanging out with their family. They're, you know, they're, they're not worrying about their possessions. They're worrying about their time that they have with their loved ones. Yep. And the more possessions you're busy accumulating for yourself, the less time you have to spend with the people that actually matter. And you, you probably don't it's even weird. like the possessions that you're accumulating. Yeah. You probably don't even like, I, I, I was like, yeah, I mean, I think that, 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 that's so true. And I think that just, just like the, for me, it's all about this. Can I connect with people? Can I see new things and can I create and can I be kind? Like those are the things that I care about, like connection, creativity, traveling, kindness. And, and if I can do that, like I want to have a place that I feel good about Mm -hmm. living in. I want to have, like, that's important to me. My, I believe in space. I believe in the spaces that we live in. I think that those are important, but man, when I'm on the road, when I'm traveling, why do I keep doing it? Because I keep getting fed. And I keep giving as much as I can, and 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 I don't I don't really foresee that changing. There are times that I'm like, man, it'd be nice to be able to chill in New York, but I've been in New York now for the last six months with pretty limited travel, um, and now I have in a week uh, another five month tour planned where I will be in New York probably not at all. Mm-hmm. And so there's all of this. Um, it's just kind of the ebbs and the flows, and I and I come I keep coming back to this whole thing of peace, which mm-hmm. is. How can I find peace in all of it? How can I find the same level of peace that I'm here where I know exactly where everything is and know exactly where all my routine is and I know exactly where all my people are and my favorite cafes and my favorite restaurants. How can I keep that same level of peace when I'm in a place that I arrived to for the very first time not knowing a single person? Because if, if, if I can achieve that, then traveling actually becomes like, um, I don't even associate traveling to it anymore. I don't even associate the word traveling to traveling anymore because mm-hmm. it's just being. Well, at that point, you reach the stage where you're, you're, you know, the overused term of a global citizen. Right? You're global. You're, yeah, you're, and, you're, 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 you're comfortable and you're at peace no matter where you go. And I think that Fred is the, the best example of that. Yes, He's he the really best is. example that I've ever seen. I've never seen anyone that can navigate with such ease and, and tranquility mm-hmm. in no matter where he is than Fred. Yeah. And, and I want to get there. And, and I think that, you know, I think that we will. I mean, he's, you know, Fred's older than us. So yeah, Fred, Fred has a couple Fred's of years. Older. A couple of so, years. <laughs> but that's kind of my goal. I think that's an awesome thing to strive for. And I think everything that we talked about is super helpful. I think there's a lot of good stuff in the book we're here. So I hope so, man. I'm excited. Uh, what's the name of the book? It's called... It's Are you allowed to right, say? Yeah, yeah. No, right now it's the working title is The Necessity of Travel. The Necessity of Travel. So... And tell us your full name. Full name is George Megre. M-E-G-R-E. It's hard to pronounce five letters. Megre? Get, Megre. It That's get, cool. It gets butchered more often than a cow, so, you know, don't be shocked by it. But, yeah, uh, awesome talking to you, man. This has been a lot of fun, actually. I appreciate you, man. Congratulations on the book. Uh, no, thank you. And, you know, definitely uh, can't wait to see what comes out of this because I think there's a lot of awesome material that uh, came out of this I mean, conversation. I hope, I hope, I hope you got some good stuff on, on there, too, so hopefully something was helpful. Hope you guys liked it. All right, bro. Good shit. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Oh.